Welcome to the Association 100 podcast. The A100 podcast is an extension of our Association 100 bi-monthly newsletter that focuses on best practices, top trends, helpful ideas, and smart strategies and tactics that work in the world of associations. The podcast will feature meaningful conversations with association professionals across the country, taking a deeper dive into trending topics, offering insights that both inform and inspire. Welcome back to the A100 podcast. I'm Colin Gallagher, and I'm joined by my co-host, Christine Stay. We're so excited to welcome Suzanne Bully to the podcast today. Suzanne is the Executive Vice President of the Council of State Restaurant Associations. Thanks for joining us, Suzanne. Colleen and Christine, it's my pleasure. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we're so happy to have you. And so let's set the stage for our audience. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Council of State Restaurant Associations and about your background, too? Absolutely. So the Council of State Restaurant Associations, some people call us CISRA because it's easier. We are the um, umbrella organization for all the 50 state restaurant associations plus D.C. and Puerto Rico. So we've had a busy and productive and um, forward moving last couple of years. Uh, our mission is really to promote the success of those state restaurant associations. So we do that in a number of ways. We offer education for them both in person and virtually, monthly calls with staff, and a lot of collaboration with our national partners, the National Restaurant Association. Wow, so I can't even imagine what the last five years have looked like for you guys. It has to have been <laughs> tremendous change, I'm sure. But I'm curious, can you tell me more about the role of the State Restaurant Association in the broader restaurant industry itself? Absolutely. So while my members are those associations, their members are the restaurants in their states. Yes, they had quite uh, the tumultuous last three or four years. Uh, it also, though, only made them stronger. Before the pandemic, they were advocating at the state and national level, promoting their members, protecting the industry. And that just went on steroids during the pandemic. They were working on local, state, national legislation. They had a lot of success with getting things into place, such as cocktails to go, which ultimately in many states has become a permanent fixture. They were instrumental in supporting the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, which offered fiscal support when restaurants had to close on a dime. They had inventory. What do we do with this? We had to figure out. I remember these phone calls um, with vendors because what we do is we bring um, opportunities to states. And so remember, we all had those plastic um, shields up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we were actually talking with a company in L.A. that did sets and they were pivoting because they weren't working. So let's make these you know, plastic wow. barriers for restaurants. So just the craziest things. But because of that, it made everybody stronger. They had to jump in. The, the lows of it were challenging, but they've become stronger because of it, and they're more nimble, and it's been ultimately a growing experience. Yeah, I think the restaurant industry in general, everybody had to pivot, but that was, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah it was, <laughs> I think it was St. Patrick's Day weekend that just, like, yeah, yeah one of the is. bar, restaurant yep. scenes globally. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so definitely a little different world. When you think about it, we are at computers a lot of our day and our jobs, and you can do that anywhere, but you can't serve people food and bring them together anywhere. That happens in a restaurant. Exactly. And we personally had a number of Zoom meetings. If it weren't for Zoom, first of all, I couldn't even run it before the pandemic or any of these virtual platforms. <laughs> so now I'm an expert. And But at one point, we had daily calls with the National Restaurant Association on closers and what they were doing. And I think ultimately it started, I think Washington State had some an outbreak in a uh, facility. And so they were the leaders with the best practices and stuff, but we shared everything that people were doing. The cocktails to go, for example, how do you buy a container that is sealable so that it can go in a car? Just crazy things like that. And because we all share information together, there was just always information. And I should go back and look at the emails because we would just blast emails out to the 52 CEOs. So it was good. I talk about showing your value <laughs> though, to your members. <laughs> I'm sure they relied very heavily on that. So as we're coming out of the pandemic or we pass it, it's hard to know. It seems like we've moved on, but what are some of the unique challenges that your members, your state association members are, are looking at now? Sure. A couple of things that were challenges before. Workforce was a challenge. Now it's on steroids. It's, it's a biggie. And you've got owners bussing tables and it's it's getting better um but it's been a big it's 
been a, on the agenda for everybody. Many of my state associations also have educational foundations that support the workforce initiative. And so several of them have grants to, to support that workforce initiative. They're doing everything from virtual job fairs to in-person job fairs. There are new apps out there that help you hire from the gig economy. You're looking for a server today at three, you put it out there in an app. And so the creativity of our industry and of our nation is evident with the products that are being delivered to answer on on issues. I love hearing that. And when these two come together, I talk about a challenge, but it's, it's good to hear the positive side of things as well. Yeah. And I guess the other piece that I mentioned workforce, but before the pandemic off premises, eating outside of a restaurant, how that happened, that was emerging. And that has also gone on steroids, particularly with Gen Z. They just, they'll sit at home and order and it, it comes to them. Some do pick up, but that's exploded as well. Our restaurants are working on how to, how to manage that and POS systems that manage your inventory. POS is point of sale system. Sorry, I don't want to talk in acronyms and restaurants, <laughs> but no. that's what that is and how they how they manage this new this new landscape. Yeah, I give them a lot of credit. And that kind of goes into when you were talking about your mission statement about education, but what are you doing to empower and equip these state associations to help your members navigate the evolving consumer demands and trends that we're talking about right now and everything on steroids and what are, what are you doing to help your members? Sure. So our in-person conferences, I'm going to talk about the one that we just had because we focused on a lot of these topics that I just mentioned, but we had a generation, multi-generational speaker talk about, you've got in our audience and at our restaurants and in our industry, you've got from um, baby boomers to millennials, to Gen X, to Gen Z, how do they work? What are their work traits? Um, how do you motivate them? That sort of thing. We also had a speaker on artificial intelligence and what that means to the industry. And that is just booming like crazy. So what we do is we educate our members. We plant the seeds. A lot of that they'll take back to their members. Some of it's to educate the associations, but some of this is to educate them so they can educate their members. We'll do something on, we did a lot on social media. Here's how you can promote your association, but here's how your operator members can use the new things like TikTok or whatever's out there, how you can measure that success, tips on the latest cameras and what to use on Instagram and that sort of thing. So we, we help them to see what's coming up in the future and how to apply that. And a lot of it is to, while we offer that education. We also have panels where they'll talk to each other and talk about, we had one on mobile apps, for example, how it's working for you, what you're doing. And we had two associations using the same product with very different approaches. So one of them was more for chapter type events. One of it was more for resources for their members. So everybody comes away with, oh, this is a cool tip. I can do that. So it, it really doesn't matter what the what the topic is. We're always pushing forward. And the beauty of our members, and I think with many associations, I love the association world, is that they will share with each other. These 52 states, they're not competitors. So I've, I came in this job and I went, gosh, I've never seen such an open group of people, but they're strong leaders in their communities. And they, I inherited this fantastic community of associations. So they just support each other so beautifully. And they were set up to for success, really, for when the pandemic hit. Let's keep talking. Let's keep these calls going. And I love to hear that. And we agree. The association world is like that. And that's why we love working with associations. It's such a nice community. And I love how forward-facing it seems that you guys are. I think the pandemic probably helped you realize you have to look into the future. Now, where was your conference at? We were in um, Wisconsin at Lake Geneva, Grand Geneva uh, Resort, and it's an opportunity for everyone to come together in the middle of the country and learn. We also, we talked about things like industry trends that you're seeing, for example, I've just listened to one of our member podcasts, and the biggest meal of the week used to be Friday lunch. That has now moved to Saturday brunch, which... Oh fascinating yep. that so okay what do you do you tell your operators all right let's beef up the the uh, staffing on on the saturdays let's look at that versus friday and you can probably see with the migration of workers and the change in the workforce with some people working remotely you can see where friday lunch maybe people working remote friday so that's changed how what do you do as, as an operator okay i need to know that i need to change my inventory ordering modes and i need to change my staffing 
And I know you touched upon this a little bit briefly about how many associations we see are centered around advocacy efforts. How big of a role does the government affairs play in the support that you offer? It, it is the number one benefit, I would say, for our states. It, I mean, they've got their work almost daily with the National Restaurant Association, particularly during the pandemic. And so what that means is lobbying their congressional delegation, whether that's on text via their members or if it's call-ins. We also have a fly-in and with the National Restaurant Association manages that actually a public affairs conference in April. So everybody comes in, they bring their operators super powerful to sit there with the senator and say, Suzanne, I know your restaurant. I love it. And I say, yeah, and like, you wouldn't believe the workforce issues. And this is how much we're spending on credit card fees. And, and that story is super impactful to hear from the mouth of babes. So that's the national example. It's state and local there. I would say my members are experts in regulation. So you've got an issue with a liquor license. You call your North Carolina Restaurant and Lodging Association. They have an expert there who can connect you with the right people on that. Yeah. And also that state, the cocktails to go as an example. But it is, it is. I would say it's the top, it's the top priority. And I was looking at the mission statements of our associations to prepare for our call. And you've got promote, protect, and advocacy almost in every single one of them. That's what they do. I love that. That's so powerful. And it, when you talk about actually having them tell that story, that's one of my favorite things about the way associations advocate is that they're not there just being, this is what we hear. They're bringing the people to government and saying, listen to them, let them tell you what's going on. And wow, that has an impact. That And, and everybody loves restaurants and these senators and congressmen know the ones. And so <laughs> it is, it's, I, I love going and listening on those and I'm just a fly on the wall because you know, I'm in this Virginia delegation. They're fine on that. But anyway, it's that's great. So you mentioned Gen Z and their preferences. So you've got these changing consumer preferences, sometimes by generation, you've got technology skyrocketing and changing every second. It seems like sustainability is a huge issue. The workforce issues that you mentioned about how do state restaurant associations that your members, how are they handling this and taking all this on and, and supporting their members? It just seems like they got through the pandemic and now there's this. It just I know. End. I know it doesn't. And it's funny. We had, I'll answer that in a second, but I want to tell you an example. When we develop the content for our conferences, we have a membership and marketing one, and then we have a government affairs one and the government affairs for, I think it was 21. It was like, all right, we need to have a session on the fact that we were hair on fire and running on adrenaline 24 seven. How do we go back to normal speed? So for them, they love it. They love, they eat and breathe this stuff. So they love it. So it was almost like, how do we release, how do we not live on adrenaline? Yeah. But I think the, the we, what I would say is they became so nimble. You know what happens when you do something for a year in your job, you can do it quicker. So they became more nimble. Several of them, now they mostly stayed with the same staffing model. Maybe a couple had some outside lobbyists during the pandemic, but they're back to uh, managing it at that level. I think they, again, they work a lot with each other. There's some new tracking tools and some technology makes it a bit easier, state and local tracking of, of information. And because that's becoming more um, streamlined, some of their positions are a bit easier, but they just have, I think with the emergence and, and um, highlighting of the importance of the state restaurant associations, it's motivated these staff to continue. They're so proud of their work and they should be. Um, in fact, we just instituted some awards for our members this year because I think they're rock stars. And you mentioned how challenging it was for the industry. And it was, but I sat back here and okay, how do I help you guys? But to see there, I wasn't talking with operators who had laid off their entire staff and had to lay themselves off. I remember hearing one chef, yeah, I laid myself off twice. I'm like, oh my God. So oh, I was like, okay, let me support you guys and I can do that. But they were the ones who were out there. And because of that, they're just stronger and they're so, there's just rock stars, all of them. They really are. I think everyone recognized that. It was, whether it was in the news or not, you saw that, that they were rock stars. We were ordering and, and trying to support local business. I felt like yep. there was so little that we could do during that time period. At least I could support yep. local businesses. So it was like, at least I could do something. I did that. I was ordering out. I remember taking a picture on my counter of an old fashioned that I ordered to go and all these three containers with the oranges <laughs> and the cherries. And the, you know, it was great. But 
We all did it. And I posted it, yeah, support them as much as I could. And, and you saw, and I would tell people, Hey, I'm in the industry. Thank you so much for working. Thank you for all you do. And that would mean a lot. And hospitality people are hospitable and they, so they didn't change. They just kept going. Now it's crazy to think about it. We're almost at the end of August, but so we have a few months left of 2023. What are some of the key initiatives that you have planned for the rest of the year that you're really excited about? For us, we have a strategic plan that focuses on collaboration and, and support to the state. So what I've got I'm focusing on for the rest of the year is some professional development for our members. And so that is, we do our conferences. I mentioned that we had a lot of calls during the pandemic. What happened during that time period was we started weekly calls with different staff groups. So there's a lot of information sharing on those calls and they're good, but we're getting a little on a burnout on that. So I'm really pivoting to make it more of can, continuing education that even if you're not on there, we will house it and we're getting professional speakers as much as I love the in-person. It's hard to get all 52 states represented there. So we're doing still some, some virtual pieces that we're packaging. And the idea is you've got access to it. If you can't join a Zoom, I think for a while there, we had Zoom burnout. I think we're a little bit, we're off of that, but we still have this opportunity to, to serve our members. And the other piece that we're looking at is one of our initiatives is to work with our a newly formed business development committee. And with that, we are looking at packaging some webinars for our partners. So it's opportunities for them to reach people. So it's not really new. It's just repackaging and making sure that we're getting to our members the correct way and using our resources. Fantastic. Yeah, it's always evolving. So it's good that you guys are ahead of the, the curve. So that's great. Yeah. And you guys have your fall government affairs conference in November, right? We do. We're in um, Scottsdale, Arizona. And oh, so nice. we're looking at that content. Yeah. And a lot of just whatever's on the forefront of the industry, we'll be looking at the cottage food industry, for example, working on what's happening at state and local legislation and what's on the um, horizon. A lot of times we'll have some of the some of the more progressive states talk about what happened with us so that the others can maybe plan for that a couple of years down the road. So again, there's that, that information sharing. We work hand in hand with the National Restaurant Association staff. So we'll look at what's happening in their world as well. And we'll have partners from national chains in as well. They work very closely with our state restaurant association government affairs team. So it's an industry handholding and we're here. Let's, let's get ready for next year sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. So you've shared a few examples already. Are there any other success stories before we let you go here for, from your members, your state restaurant associations for how they've supported their members that you'd like to share? I talked about grants. I would say, yeah, the Michigan Restaurant Lodging Association, they are super creative, forward thinking with their educational foundation. So they're developing um, an institute that works within their educational foundation that supports workforce and the industry. So they've been able to look at some state funding examples. And so I know other states are looking at what they're doing there. Our foundations were always important, and I mentioned that they work on workforce. They also support some um, statewide programs like ProStart, which is a high school program that teaches culinary and management at the high school level, and that culinary in a state competition, ultimately a national that has really imploded over the past couple of years. So I would say our educational foundation elements, those are at the forefront now. We've incorporated and added in a, a foundation track to our summer conference, for example, to support their initiatives. So as we see things change, we are supporting and pivoting. Oh, there's that word, pivoting, to support, to <laughs> help their needs. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, great. Thank you so much for this. We really appreciate it. And really good info. And I just love how education really takes forefront for you guys. I, I love that. I think it's so crucial to your members. So we do conclude every podcast with a little lightning round fun, just so our audience can get to know you a little bit better. So I'm going to just shoot these questions at you. So where did you grow up? I grew up in outside the Beltway, Vienna, Virginia. Moved away for 20 years, lived in Northeast Florida and St. Augustine upon Vedra, and I'm back. The oh. association uh, headquarters is in D.C., so that's where it's I am. Here, yeah. Yeah. What would be your Starbucks order? Oh, I am so bland, but I am there every morning. It is a grande pike with half and half, and but it's so hot and lovely. I try to make it at home. It's not the same. No, <laughs> and I, I'm the same way. I'm just, very simple. <laughs> Love it. If you won the lottery tomorrow, would you still work? 
I would, but it would be a volunteer. And I love this when I did some career counseling. I think that's the perfect question. If you didn't have to work, what would you do? So I would be supporting some needy group. I love that. I love that what we do here is supporting the industry. And when I worked with the chef's group out of St. Augustine, Florida, we instituted the health insurance program. And I just felt so empowered that I was getting insurance to people in need. So something like that. I love giving back. Oh, I love that. I love hearing that. What was the last show that you binge watched? I'm more of a podcast person. And so I know. No. I feel like it's this free resource. Oh my gosh. Um, right? Yeah. And I've got this woman who's a who's an MD and she was a former CrossFit person and she has a health podcast. It's the craziest thing I came upon her. I also listen to Working Lunch. It's Aligned Public Strategies. It's a, an advocacy firm out of um, Orlando and they talk about the restaurant industry. So that's my run walk. <laughs> love it. I'll have to add it to my list. I know we're always looking for recommendations. So that's okay. Food that you could not live without. Oh, goodness. Probably peanut butter. I love it. It's a good oh. protein, although some people call it a fat, but I think it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And do you just plain on a spoon or do you like it on? Um, it's a spoon usually. It's like my little dessert, like a teaspoon. Yeah. If you're on Weight Watchers, that's okay. one point. I love that. And then what would be your bucket list travel destination somewhere that you really haven't, and it could be something that you want to do or a place that you want to go. It is the Northern Lights. I just really want to see those. And so I've, that's out there. And Alaska Char is our Alaska member. So I'm going to have to uh, see if there's an event that I should visit up there. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I definitely. I know that's on my bucket list too. I'd love to do that either Alaska or go up to Iceland. And I'm, I think it's one of those things you see these photos and they probably do not even do it any yeah. what yeah. than justice. Oh, I bet. Yeah. It has to be unbelievable in person. Oh my yeah. God. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was You're wonderful. Welcome. I know our audience will love it. And that's a wrap on today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Association 100 podcast brought to you by the A100 publishing team powered by Onward and Upward Marketing and Communications. You can subscribe to the Association 100 podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and all of your favorite podcast listening apps so you'll never miss out or listen via our website at theassociation100.com. Follow us on Twitter at Association100, that's Association100, for all the latest insights and trends impacting the world of associations. Thanks for tuning in.